not far from Chitrakoot, was an outpost of the Rakshasas or demons called Janistan, in the charge of a famous warrior named Kur, who was a brother of Ravan. And from this station, fierce Rakshasas ranged the forest round, molesting the sages in their isolated ashrams. They made life so insecure that the ascetics abandoned their hermitages in the Chitrakoot region, in spite of all that Ram could do to dissuade them. After Bharat's departure, Ram was not quite happy in Chitrakoot. The face of his beloved brother, tearful with disappointment, and the sad drooping form of his widowed mother were ever before his mind's eye. And now that the going away of the sages had deprived him of their companionship, the lonely hut was so full of sad memories that he made up his mind to seek some other resting place in the Dundak forest. So they left Chitrakoot and proceeded to the hermitage of sage Atri, who knew the country to seek his advice as to where they might establish themselves. They were most affectionately received, and Sita won the heart of Atri's wife, the saintly Anasuya, who, delighted at finding in her a perfect embodiment of wifely virtues, blessed her and presented her with beautiful garments and auspicious cosmetics. Anasuya was the embodiment of pure womanhood, and her gifts added beauty and inner strength to Sita. Then they made inquiries concerning the way and resumed their journey. Walking through the great Dundak forest, Ram, Sita and Lakshman reached a spot where many rishis or sages lived. Even as they approached the place, they saw the sacrificial materials bark garments and deerskins spread out to dry, and they knew it was a colony of holy men. The place was beautiful to look at. Birds and animals moved about with the freedom from fear, born of affectionate familiarity with their human neighbors. Ripe fruits hung from the trees. The beautiful sound of Vedic chanting was heard. As they came near, they saw the radiant faces of the rishis who welcomed Ram. O king, you are our protector, they said. Whether we are in the town or in the forest, you are our king. And they gave the newcomers all they needed and a place in which to rest. The following morning, the three took leave of the sages and re-entered the forest, which was now denser than before, and there were tigers and other wild animals there. So they proceeded slowly and cautiously. Suddenly, a gigantic form, distorted like a broken fragment of a hill, rushed at them, making a blood-curdling noise. It was a man-eating Rakshasa, and his roar was like thunder. He was indescribably ugly, and the tiger skin he wore was covered with blood, while pieces of flesh of the slaughtered beast were still sticking to it. The corpses of three lions and the head of an elephant recently slain were impaled and strung in a row on the great spear which he shook menacingly at them. The Rakshasa lifted his weapon, roared horribly, and springing forward, lifted Sita. And as he held her, he shouted at the princes, Who are you, little fellows? How dare you enter this forest? You look young, but wear matted hair and bark garments. You have disguised yourself as ascetics. Yet you carry bows and arrows and go about with this woman by your side. Whom are you trying to cheat? Are you not ashamed of yourselves? You are besmirching the good name of the rishis by your conduct, you hypocrites. Know that I am Virad himself. The flesh of rishis is my daily food. I shall have this lovely damsel for my wife, do you understand? I shall now drink your blood, you villain. Held in his grasp, Sita trembled with fear. Lakshman, hissing like an angry snake, said, Ram, look at what my bow and arrow can do. The earth will presently drink this monster's blood. My wrath, which was denied outlet at Ayodhya, I shall now direct on this monster and shatter him, as Indra did the winged mountains of the past. I shall attack this creature and slay him. The rod roared again. Who are you? Tell me at once. Ram's face glowed with courage, and calmly he said, 
We are princes of the Ikshvaku race. We have come to live in the forest. May we know who you are? The Rakshasa answered, And so, you are the sons of Dazarath, are you? My father's name is Jai, and I am known among the Rakshasas as Virad. You puny warriors carrying arms. What can you and your ridiculous weapons do to me? I have secured a boon from Lord Brahma that no weapon can hurt me. Leave this girl here and run away if you wish to save your lives. Ram's eyes grew red with anger. It is time for you to go to the Lord of Death, he said, and bent his bow and shot a sharp arrow at the monster. It pierced his body and emerged red with blood, glistening like fire, and fell on the earth beyond. But the Rakshasa was not killed. Enraged by the pain, he placed Sita on the ground, and lifting his spear and opening his mouth wide, rushed towards Ram and Lakshman. The princes sent a shower of arrows at him. The arrows stuck so thick on his body that he bristled all over like a gigantic porcupine. The Rakshasa, however, laughed and shook his limbs, and down fell all the darts. He straightened himself and lifted his spear again. Ram and Lakshman, with two arrows, broke the spear and rushed at him sword in hand but he lifted them both up with his hands and put them on his shoulders and strode off into the forest. Sita saw them disappear in the darkness of the jungle and wept aloud. Ram and Lakshman, seated one on each shoulder, knowing that weapons could not kill him, wrenched off his arms and threw them down. Then they attacked him with their hands and feet. Still, they could not kill him on account of Lord Brahma's boon, but the agony of his wounds was so great that he howled. Unfortunately for him, he had asked for immunity from slaughter, but not from pain. The brothers threw down the exhausted monster, and Ram planted his in his neck to prevent him from rising. The touch of Ram's feet cleared the mist and curse he had incurred in a previous birth had shrouded his understanding. And in the sudden light of recollection, he joined his hands and said humbly, Your feet have touched me, Lord, and my eyes are open. I have realized who you are. I am under a curse, but you can save me. <laughs> I am not a Rakshasa by birth, but a Gandharva, a celestial musician. The boon I secured prevents my going to heaven. If you could somehow kill me, I shall recover my former celestial form and go there. Accordingly, Ram and Lakshman smashed him without weapons and buried him in a pit they dug in the earth. And the Rakshasa returned to the world of the Gandharvas. Then the princes went back to the place where Sita stood terrified and told her all that happened. They proceeded to the ashram of Sharabhanga. Indra was there with the other gods, talking to the rishi. Knowing that Ram had arrived, he cut short his talk and went away. Then Ram, with his brother and wife, approached the rishi and humbly saluted him. The old ascetic said, It is for you I have been waiting. It is time for me to leave this body, but my wish was to see you first. And so I have been waiting. Now that my desire is fulfilled, I pass on to you all the merit of my penances. Ram answered, My lord, should I not earn my own merit? How can I receive what you have earned? I have renounced everything to live in the forest. Advise me where I can best find an abode in the forest and send me forth with your blessing. The Rishi knew the secret of Ram's divine incarnation and told him, Learn from the sage Sutikshna where in the forest you should dwell. Then Sharabhanga kindled a fire and entered it. The gross body perished in the flames, and a youthful ethereal form rose from the pyre and floated up to the heavens. When the rishis of that forest heard the news of Virad's death, they came to Ram and surrounded him. It is our good fortune, O king, they said, 
that you have come to dwell in this region. Hereafter we shall perform our penance, untroubled by rakshasas. Look at those bones scattered all around. They are the remains of ascetics killed and eaten by the rakshasas. The sages on the banks of the Pampa and Mandakini rivers live in constant fear of their lives from these man-eating monsters. The king's duty, from which he may not fail without sin, is to protect his subjects. Just as householders pay taxes, a share of the merit of our penances goes to the king's benefit. You are radiant like Indra, king of the gods. Protect us from this persecution of the Rakshasas. You are our only refuge. Ram answered, I am bound, O great ones, to obey your command. I gave up kingship and came to the forest in obedience to my father's wish. If in discharging my duty as a son, I can also serve you and do some good, I shall count myself twice blessed. I shall stay in the forest and destroy the Rakshasas and free you from trouble. So shed your fear. Ram's promise of help gave relief and joy to the rishis. Ram, Lakshman and Sita then proceeded towards the ashram of Sutikshna. They came to a big hill surrounded by a thick forest which they entered. There they saw bark garments drying in the sun and a little later came upon the old rishi himself. Saluting him, the prince said, My name is Ram, O holy sage. I have come to see you and I pray for your blessing. The sage rose to embrace him. Welcome, defender of virtue. My ashram is lit up by your presence. It is now yours. When I heard you had left Ayodhya and taken up your abode at Chitrakoot, I knew you would come here and have lived in the hope of seeing you, else I would have long ago given up this body. The merit I have accumulated I now pass on to you. Take it for yourself, your brother and the princess. The sage's face was bright with the light of a long holy life. It was the custom of the rishis to offer their acquired merit to those who came as their guests. But Ram replied, O sage, I must earn merit by my own good deeds. With your blessing, I still hope to do so. I wish to dwell in the forest. The sage, Sharabanga, directed me here to receive your blessing and seek your instructions as to where I could build a home for the rest of my stay in the forest. The rishi's face was bright with joy and he said meaningfully, You may live in this ashram. There are many rishis living here. The forest is full of fruit and roots. But evil demons are about, molesting the rishis and obstructing their penance. The sages are unable to bear this trouble. But for this, the place is good. The prince understood what the sage meant to convey. He bent and strung his bow and said, Holy sage, I shall destroy these evildoers. My bow is strong and sharp are my arrows. It is not proper that we should dwell in this ashram. It may interrupt your penance. We shall find a place for ourselves in the neighborhood. Permit us to do so. That night, they stayed in the sage's ashram as his guests. The following morning, the three got up and bathed in the cool water, fragrant with flowers, lit the sacrificial fire, performed their worship, and touched the feet of the sage. By your grace, we spent a good night. We desire to see the other rishis in the region and receive their blessings too. It is good to set out before the sun grows hot. Please give us leave to go. The sage embraced the princes and blessed them, saying, Visit the good rishis in the Dundak forest. They have all gone through great austerities and obtained divine powers. The forest is indeed beautiful with deer and birds and lotus-filled tanks and the hills with cascades and peacocks. Lakshman, go now with your brother and with Sita. Come to this ashram whenever you feel like. The three walked round the sage according to custom and took leave of him. Sita handed to them their swords, bows and quivers, and the princes set out, more radiant than before, because of the great sage's blessings.